what's poppin' everybody, it's Chris Milk, aka Honey Bunch, back with an episode of Milk with Honey Bunch. Today's episode is very special. I'm very happy that I was able to get this schedule, get it happening. Um, you know, I took a shot in the dark. I found Mr. Hakeem Vallis through TikTok. I saw he had free Zoom like uh, calls or every time like that. Um, can't exactly remember what it was now. But I was like, hmm, would I be able to turn that into an interview? I shot him an email. Um, he sent a response back. We got it set up. I, uh, if you're on my Snapchat, then you remember I was sort of like, guys, I'm freaking out. I don't know what to do. I'm surprised he responded, everything like that. It was it was great. And, um, you know, I'm glad that we were able to get it happening. It gave me a lot of motivation for the show, seeing the potential and seeing how a reach out email should go and how it can go and everything along those lines. But today's interview episode is with Mr. Hakeem Vallis, NFL player. He played before and he's making a comeback now. I'm very happy to see him doing that. Best wishes for that. And um, he is an entrepreneur. He has his own business called Perspective Global Media. We get into what that is and what they do later on in the episode, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, it's a great episode. You know, we talk about his before NFL, during, after, the business side of everything, ways to make money as a uh, under-18 person. He gives tips about that. You're going to want to stick to the end of this episode. And um, it's a fantastic one uh, for the people on YouTube before Simply say you're gonna click off, so uh, subscribe and notifications. That makes sense. Come back Friday because I have something um, new that I'm starting, and I want. I'm very excited for that. I don't honestly. I don't know if I want to switch up the schedule. I might either post next week and switch up the off schedule because what we have right now is for my school. If you're not at Warren, um, we have off every other days and. The days that we're posting right now for the actual month with Honey Bunch weeks are exactly the days that I go to school, so I'm having to post during during my calculus class, and that's not the most effective way that I want to go about it. I want to be able to at least wake up in the morning, post, go back to sleep, or start my day then at 8 o'clock, but um, I'll figure it out because we're getting some content planned out. We have... After this one, four episodes, two interviews, two old ones. Um, so we'll, we'll we get it planned out. Uh, I'm glad that I am doing the bi-weekly schedule thing, though, because it's helping me stretch out my time, get a week to, one, relax, not having to force myself to do work for this so much, and also to, you know, um, what am I trying to say? Just not, I'm not working myself too hard not stress myself out, everything like that. And it gives me a chance to interview people and make things happen for the show instead of doing things weekly and running out of content and have to put things that I'm not proud of, you know, quality over quantity. I almost messed it up. But that would do it for this episode. Or that would do for this intro, sorry. It's been a minute, you know, two weeks. That'll do it, but I like how we're doing things. Much with Honey Bunch is doing big things, and I'm glad we have a... Another special guest that I'm going to get an interview with. Uh, eventually, every guest is special, but you know, in terms of drawing people in and everything like that, you'll, 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 you'll get the interview with them soon. But yeah, enjoy the episode. Today, I'm joined by a former NFL tight end for my Arizona Cardinals, the Lions of Detroit, and the New York Giants. He is an entrepreneur for Perspective Global Media, and he is also making a comeback to the NFL. As we speak today, I have Hakeem Valles. How are you doing, sir? Christian, I'm good. I appreciate the, the, the amazing introduction. And, uh, thank you for having me on the show. Uh, thank you for coming out. I really appreciate this. And um, the meals that we have for today, do you know if you can go ahead and, and um, explain what you have? Well, I've got uh, avocado toast with uh, three scrambled eggs on top. And then we got a gluten-free uh, chocolate chip muffin. You cooked it all yourself, too? No, this is a coffee house it's across the street from my, my house. Okay. Um, I, I've tried avocado toast. I'm if you own it, just avocados in general, but maybe maybe that's an older thing for you. 
<laughs> I have a typically just a blueberry bagel with some cream cheese and also in one of my new favorite beverages, some oat milk. So I'm just going to get the first first thing of these. Just... Whoa, 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 I'm gonna have to stop you right there. Stats show that you're about to click off in the next few seconds. So stick around, and while you're here, subscribe. Go ahead and scroll down, click that button, and also hit that notification bell, just so you can get notified every time I drop a video on here. We got clips, we got the videos, we got the midweeks, everything, maybe an update, everything going great on here. So we can go and have a party on YouTube, baby. Now, back to the video. And, um... To start it off, what I remember um, seeing is that even before you were in the NFL and everything, you played other positions such as quarterback, defensive back. I think there were a few others. How did you get into um, doing multiple of those positions? Was it just you, that type of athlete? Uh, it was just what I was good at. You know, I played quarterback since like, I was eight years old. As I got taller, I just kind of gravitated to wide receiver when I got to high school. I played quarterback pretty much up to high school, quarterback and some defense. And then, uh, you know, as I was playing wide receiver through college, after high school, I realized I was, I was a bench player. I was behind a guy who was an NFL tight end as well and receiver as well. And uh, just being self-aware, I realized I was going to be able to get on the field, get some catches and do my thing at tight end. That's why I moved to tight end. Um, how did you have to transition the positions? Like, um, what sort of level of difficulty was it? And maybe you explain why, but how was the overall transition of positions like for you? Well, when I was, like quarterback to receiver wasn't that hard because I always had hands. Receiver to tight end was an interesting transition. I had to put on about 40 pounds in a month. And yeah, in that month, I went through a creatine, uh, like, loading phase. Went through, had a, a bowl of cottage cheese with every meal with hard-boiled eggs and celery in it. Disgusting. I used to chase it with five cups of Gatorade. But I did it every meal. And uh, I used to have, like, pizza with every meal as well. Um, and I, you know, I puffed up really big and then had to tighten myself up as the year went on, but kind of put that weight on really fast. That was definitely the hardest part of the transition. And then learning how to block with my legs versus my arms. The receiver, you know, you stop blocking, there's the tight end, you're driving. Um, like number wise for the weights, what was the jump, you know, from receiver to tight end? I know typically a lot of the tight ends that you see are heavier. Um, then the receivers. So what was the sort of weight number uh, gap? In college, it was one night. I went from 195 to 235 in a month. One month? And that was all you had to do? It wasn't all I had to do. I mean, weight-wise, I, I got there, and then I, I was kind of chubby because I wasn't – it wasn't, like, all muscle. So over that the rest of the year, I just had to get in shape and tighten it up and then so, solidify myself as about a – 242 to 245 time tight end. And when I was in the NFL, I went from my weight, like one, like when I was in the Cardinals, I used to have to be between 247 and 252. And then they wanted me between 260 and 265. And then when I was on the Lions, I went back to 247 and 252. Yeah, I remember um, hearing something about, like, definitely weight in the NFL and probably other leagues. Maintaining the weight is very important, especially um, with the positions that you're at and everything. But I'm glad you mentioned the NFL because going into it initially, um, you were projected to get drafted, but that did not happen. So what impact did going undrafted have on you, you know, as a younger player and as an athlete overall? I'm more expected to go actually undrafted than drafted. If I got drafted, it's going to be more of a surprise. I always had a chip on my shoulder, just naturally being a bench player in college and having one scholarship coming out of high school. So it was really just nothing new. And I'm trying to say that you guys are all going to have to wait and see. And that's how I just kind of approached it with that type of mindset. And um, once you actually did get playing time, 
with the Cardinals at first, what was your reaction to the buzz, you know, the lights, the energy of being in an NFL game? I mean, it was crazy. My first game was Thursday night football against the Niners. So it was mm. primetime games are a little bit different in terms of how much more buzz, how much more media, how many more cameras are even allowed on the field, how much more gear you get. It's weird, but you get a whole set of new gear on Sunday night, Monday night, Thursday night games. Wow. Um, so it was cool. It was a lot, but it was it was cool. It wasn't like overwhelming in that sense. I was prepared and ready for it, and uh, did my thing. Had a drop though in my first game. Uh, well, we'll definitely get back to the NFL later on. But um, going to the business aspect of your life, um, I noticed that a lot of people sort of overlook and overthink the uh, majors of business and colleges and everything. You know, your marketing, your Business administration, management, all that. Um, how did your business administration studies at Monmouth um, sort of evolve and advance your mind of business? Honestly, they did nothing at all. <laughs> I screwed up with that. I mean, I love Monmouth to death. My, my degree was business administration and concentration in real estate. I learned a lot from a high level on learning about real estate law, learning about terminology, learning how to network myself in those groups of people and stuff of that sort. But ultimately learned how to be an employee at like a large commercial real estate firm, which I didn't want to do. You know, your average college marketing class and different facets of uh, concentrations and degrees of business are usually very behind on the times. So a lot of the times, I think a marketing, a business marketing degree in college just isn't even practical in that sense. Um, but from a real estate sense, it, it got my feet wet. It got me, like I knew I wanted to do real estate. I knew even more I wanted to do real estate, but I knew I didn't want to be on the side that the people on my platform wanted to be on. I wanted to be the person who actually owned the property. So it still obviously helped in that sense. Introducing a new way to enjoy much with Honey Bunch. Clips. Tune in on Fridays to YouTube to catch bite-sized moments of the show instead of watching full episodes. Fridays on Munch with Honey Bunch. Yeah, because I noticed, like, especially now with um, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, all those social media, we have people that are in the business um, side sort of teaching people about what you can get without having to actually go to college. And there's a lot of um, free online courses just to learn without actually um, sacrificing a major or minor in college. Uh, um, you know, if you could explain your infamous story of the four bedroom apartment that you rented out once you got to the league. Yeah. So my, uh, sorry, I just took a bite. Very good. So my rookie year, I was playing, uh, I was playing two grand a month for an apartment built, uh, like just like rent an apartment, like one bedroom, month to month in Tempe, Arizona. And I slowly but surely realized I was gonna spend 24 grand on rent that year. Cause I watched my brother, who used to pick for the Oakland Raiders. When he went from the Raiders to the Bills, he was still stuck in a lease and had to pay like 18 grand out of pocket to get out of his lease. And like watching that made me realize that I, one, I didn't want, obviously didn't want that to happen to me. So that's why I did the month to month. But then I was like, I'm going to spend $24,000 to see on rent if I stay with the partners. Why don't I look into this house hacking strategy? And there's this house hacking strategy. Essentially what I did was utilize my FHA loan to buy a four unit apartment building and put down three and a half percent. You know, most people think, FHA loan, low money down option is only for a single family house. And that's essentially what they only tell you. And in reality, you can buy a single family home, a duplex, triplex, or fourplex, putting on the three and a half percent down. So after my rookie year ended, I, uh, I found a fourplex in North Phoenix, bought it for 268,000, put down 13,000, lived in one unit. My mortgage was 1,700. My tenants bought it more than a mortgage, lived for free. When I got cut, took that unit, rented it out, and uh, actually just sold that property the weekend of 4th of July. Um, owned it for three and a half years. Made a solid, solid return on it a couple years later. I hear that um, 
everything was able to sort of come around and pay off for you. And um, was going into business and sort of working for yourself always planning or what you plan to be your uh, sort of life after football option? Yeah, I definitely say so. I mean, I just consider myself a lifelong entrepreneur. You know, in fifth grade, I had a landscaping company. In middle school, I used to hustle Skittles. Mom used to go, my mom used to go to Sam's Club for me. And I used to uh, go to school with two backpacks, one with books and one with Skittles. And then uh, transitioning from high school to college, I, I started an iPhone repair business and used to fix three to four iPhones a day. Um, while I was in college. So I always knew like just DNA wise that I'm an entrepreneur and ultimately whatever I was going to get into, I was going to work for myself and utilize just the creative DNA that I was gifted. It's great to see that you're always working um, for things like that. When you said the uh, Skittles, because even now, a few years ago, um, they hated for students to sell things like e. people have to sort of sell their stuff at school secret, like post online. Yeah, I do it. I had to do it secretly. Oh, secret for you too. After a while, I got first, it was like kind of a cool thing. And then it started to crack down and I was just doing it secretly. But like, so my teachers were buying Skittles from me. Uh, I, even the teachers were in on it too? Yeah. Man. Yeah, we have some people like wearing big uh, jackets, hiding stuff in them, got a, a rolling suitcase too. I mean, I guess you got to chase whatever you can. But, um, so I know you had an entrepreneur-like mindset, essentially your whole life, like you said. And um, you have your own business perspective global media you know if you could sort of explain to me to get a better understanding and to everyone else what the business is yeah so perspective global media is a we're a podcast production company where essentially we help people and hold their hands on launching a podcast so we either have like a 90-day product where we hold your hand to episode four of your show um and then we're in the future launching these uh one month like once a week or four sessions of essentially like a podcast you type of academy where we're essentially just holding your hand through getting you ready for the launch of your show kind of everything answered everything ran through the tech the micro content kind of everything so one thing that we hone on is that a lot of people miss out on is that i think podcasts are a saturated market and it's audacious to think that people will listen to your entire episode from the beginning. So I think that there's way more value on micro content than your full episode. So I think the, the five, one to three minute clips within each episode are more valuable than the full episode itself. Like the clip of me talking about how I bought my apartment building is arguably going to get more views and more listens if you posted that on your Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook than just this episode alone. And if you don't do that, you're missing out on those people who would have gotten exposed to that content. So one thing that we pride ourselves on is extracting those pieces of micro content. And so it's not stressful for people to start their shows, you know. People love running a podcast and interviewing people, but they don't like doing the tech behind it. And uh, that's where a lot of people tend to burn out. And that's kind of where we, uh, we come in. Yeah, I think I definitely, um, I keep, I'm going to keep checking see if I can get more involved in that. But um, something else I noticed after you had um, your initial retirement, you got into speaking, um, you know, public speaking, everything like that. And that, that's even how I um, came across your TikTok at first. And I was like, oh, wow, that's all great. Everything like that. Um, what kind, of, what kind of opportunities do you get, um, you know, to reach out to people from uh, your public speaking? Oh, yeah. Or just, like, putting out content of, like, speaking and stuff of that sort. I mean, that it's the speaking is something that I want to do for a long time. Um, I have a unique speaking style where I just tell my truths for 15 to 20 minutes and pontificate my thoughts on whatever the context of the audience is in that sense. And then I open it up for Q&A. So my, my, uh, most of my talk is, it's 20% me talking and 80% me going deeper on questions from the audience because I've set the framework with my initial presentation for people to ask questions. Um, but opportunities that, you know, come out of it are, you know, a whole bunch of different opportunities, whether it's 
from the content that I put out uh, has gotten me into different, I mean, can, I'm in the cannabis industry. I've gotten deeper into the cannabis space through speaking opportunities. I've gotten more speaking opportunities through speaking opportunities than guests <laughs> on a lot of podcasts from it. Um, introduced to different new clients after hearing me speak on different topics. One of, the, one of the talks that I do a lot is the digital state of real estate. And I tend to work with a lot of real estate uh, professionals with our media company. So it's ultimately just helped me. Like my, my biggest ROI from speaking is the content recorded myself. So I can now redistribute that content to my audience and all the different platforms to continue to just build this brand. Yeah, because I noticed you've really been able to um, figure out how to use your platform well. And I remember seeing one of your videos about how to use LinkedIn to your advantage and make it more than just a job thing. But, um, let's go and talk about your return to football. Um, at this time of recording, last night, you had posted um, some videos about how you're planning on making your comeback to the NFL. What um, is the difference in the situation of February 2019? when you decided to retire compared to right now when you're planning to make your comeback? Uh, it's definitely a lot more mental clarity. Um, you know, I don't judge myself or care about the opinions of others of how I'm feeling at a specific time. So at a specific time in February 2019, I was, I hated football. I was, you know, going to the facility upset, depressed every day and was not about it, wanted to get out of there as ASAP and couldn't wait for the season to end so I could be done with football. And a year and a half later, year and a half older, wiser, more clarity, and 12 employees around me now. So I'm not a one man show, uh, no longer with the mother of my child and now I'm like a co-parenting relationship. It's just definitely brought me a lot more clarity of what I want to do and how I want to do things and got that itch back playing football again and been working out and realize I still got it. Close your eyes. Imagine this. You, me, food, questions? Now open your eyes. Bam! If you think that you or someone you know would be a great fit for a guest on Much with Honey Bunch, then be sure to fill out the form in the link in the podcast or YouTube description. And you never know, you might be chosen. But now, back to the conversation. That's great. Um, how has your exercises ramped up from, um, you know, maybe I, I can tell you probably been keeping in shape, but how is it ramped back up to um, what the NFL level would be expected? Uh, it, I mean, honestly, it, I was, I didn't work out for a whole year. Like, I didn't do anything. <laughs> um, and then when I made the decision to come back, I did 30 days of this thing called the Murph challenge, which is essentially, uh, 100 pull-ups, 200 push-ups, 300 air squats with a 20-pound vest on. And then, like, you run a mile before doing that and then run a mile after doing that. And then you time yourself every day and see how much faster you can get. Like, I went from doing that in an hour and 18 to doing it in the fastest I got was 33 minutes something, I want to say. I'm not sure what the next. But it was a... I mean, it was a grueling, grueling workout, but I did that to essentially get my mindset back into the working out phase and then get, shock my body a little bit so I can start lifting heavy again. And since then, just been lifting and running and running routes. And before that, I, I, I needed that year off. It's been 20 years of nonstop working out every, you know what I mean? Playing, playing a different sport every season, every, you know, since I was five years old. Yeah, the thought of that. You know, I'm out of shape. The thought of all of that definitely sounds like, eh, but I know you definitely have to have a sort of um, strong mind for that. And how will running um, perspective global media um, as an athlete be different this time compared to the first run? Yeah, so I wasn't in running perspective while I was playing, but it was, it's going to be a lot different because just the, the scale and the team that I have around me, you know, being, not being able to, not being a bottleneck in every facet of the business um, so can run as good if not better without me on the pulse of it, you know, 24 hours a day. And as I play more, I'll probably continue to hire even more and more and more and more and more to continuously scale with more experts around me. And um, 
similar to you know how Carmelo Anthony got back into um, playing in the NBA, how does one go from inactive to back on a team and um, hitting the ground running again? Right now, with the NFL, until yesterday, they weren't allowed to bring any guys in for tryouts. So, it's uh, after not playing for a year, a team's not going to sign me without seeing me work out. So, essentially, I got a my, – my agent texted me yesterday. They just lifted the ban on bringing the guys in for tryouts. It's my agent having conversations with different scouts, um, me doing a workout and recording it. And so, my agent can send that to some scouts as well. I'm kind of taking it from there. Mm. Yeah, it definitely must be tough, you know, making your comeback during, you know, all this, especially with the uncertainty of um, how everything's going to work out. And um, it's great to see you planning on actually doing all this because, you know, you're only 27 and you have a lot of good years left in the tank. The last thing before we go and hop off of this, I was wondering, um, you know, my general audience right now is just a lot of people under 18 and worrying about making money or anything. Uh, do you know if you have a few tips on how that would be possible for legal uh options and everything legal options to make money right now uh i think flipping is always a good idea uh, starting with the inventory of your own home and figuring out the stuff that you can sell like old iphone headphones old phones old headphones uh shoes like and, like there's so much stuff that you can start in your own personal surrounding and then uh like a space that i haven't diving into yet but i know is hot is the sports card market it's super hot i know gary v and his entire audience is doing great things there i think he just dropped an entire like a deep 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 read on on like how to, how to start flipping sports cards in that sense um what else would I do? I just figure out how to, like, depending on if you're entrepreneurial or not, or if you just want to hustle and grind and just make money, I just reach out to people who are high performers and figure out things, ways that you can bring value to them to make their life easier. You know what I mean? Because I'm sure somebody would pay. Like, I'll answer emails for you all week. Like, if, if you're young and you want to make money, that's what you do something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, like, for example, is that your art behind you? Uh, yeah, so I colored all these and then made this and Photoshop and everything. But again, I think if you have a skill like that, I think now is a great time to start, like with school probably not going to happen. I think there's a lot of parents with kids from ages 7 through 11 who are, would love an extra, because if their schools are closed, they'd love an extra hour to themselves while their kid was being consumed, not by a teacher or something of that sort. Meaning, if I was good at art, like you, like behind you, I would do some type of drawing class for like three times a week for kids like that are in that age group. I would take five hours and understand Facebook ads and understand that you can target a mom that lives in one of this, these XYZ area codes, one of the highest, highest uh, what's the word, highest uh, income earning area codes in the country. You can target that mom who has a kid in between that age group that I said and hit them with ads of, are you sick and tired of being around your kid? I host drawing classes three times a week, $50 an hour, blah, blah, whatever, whatever, figuring out the creative and the context on the ad side. But I believe that doing that, if you have, if you work three times a week for one hour a day, those three times a week, and you have, I think it's 15 clients in each of those uh, sessions, you're making over six figures a year. And like that's just the math behind it, which is like which is wild and it's doable. Like that's literally forty-five clients, forty-five kids and families. And I think if you do a referral program within there of like, you know, you get five, ten dollars off each family you recommend, parents talk. And if you actually wind up being good at that, whether it's drawing, whether it's teaching digital art, whether it's coding, whether it's working out and exercise whether it's anything that kind of appeals to that that age group that's going to save a lot of time for those types of people i think like time is the biggest like time time is the biggest thing right now and you can make a lot of money helping people get some of their time back especially if you're young and you've got some type of skill or talent like you have to draw yeah i really appreciate all that insight i would definitely look for more opportunities to grow like that um 
yeah, I really wish you good luck on your journey back and um, we wish to see everything for you. So that would do it for this episode of Month with Honey Bunch. Have a day, everyone.